I'm Paul Sullivan, your host on the Company of Dads podcast, where we explore the sweet, sublime, strange, and silly aspects of being a lead dad in a world where men often feel they have to hide or at least not talk about their parenting role. I know this from firsthand experience as a lead dad to my three girls, three dogs, three cats, and somewhat remarkably, three fish who are still alive. I did all this while managing my career and striving to be an above average husband. One thing I know for sure about being a lead dad is it's not a normal role. You're not doing what dads have traditionally done, going to work and leaving the parenting to mom or someone else. Nor are you always welcome into the world where moms are the primary caregivers. But here at the Company of Dads, our goal is to shake all that off and focus on what really matters. Family, friendship, finance, and fun. Today, my guest is Alex McKinsey. He's a lead dad who has literally had the most interesting combination of jobs ever. He's worked in the fields and in restaurants. He's been a rock music producer, names like Katy Perry and Eminem, and a public radio producer. The fish business, he's swum in that tank. He's also been known as the emperor of ice cream. And now he's an adjunct professor at Montana State. A lot to unpack here. Welcome, Alex, to the Company of Dads podcast. How are you today? Paul, I'm great. It's really great to be here. And I just want to say I've, I've so enjoyed your first few episodes. I don't know that uh, my research is up to par with Chris and Shockley, and I'm probably never going to be drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles, but hopefully, hopefully I have something interesting to share. Fantastic. You know, uh, Alex, yeah, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm a sucker for flattery. So whenever we start off that way, I think. Oh, great. Be a good <laughs> awesome. Uh, You're in good company. Before you became a husband, a father, and a lead dad, uh, you had a very diverse career. So chart me a, a path through the life of Alex. I mean, what, what connected one job to the next? Yeah. Um, so in a nutshell, I always just pursued what was interesting to me, and that could change like the wind at times. Um, and money was never part of the pursuit. Um, you know, I'm a little embarrassed to say that when I was younger, when there was more ego attached status was part of it. And the people that I could surround myself with was maybe interesting to me. That's a lot less interesting to me now. Um, but I grew up in a house, uh, with a, a recording studio. My dad was a musician, um, on the side of his, of his day job as an addictions counselor. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a garden, um, vegetable garden growing up. Where was uh, this? Where'd you grow up? In Massachusetts, north of Boston, uh, yep. Gloucester. So fishing, actually a fishing community. I believe it's the nation's still oldest active fishing port. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I graduated from high school, I went into college initially uh, in Massachusetts for a music production, but I was a horrible student. Um, I was really mixed up about what my interests were. Mostly my interest at the time was smoking pot. Uh, so I dropped out. Um, and then I just kind of, bounced all over the place for like 10 years. Um, I got really into this organization called Woof. It allows you to travel the world and work on organic farms in exchange for room and board. So I had some really amazing experiences in Italy, uh, some really bad experiences in Costa Rica, a little bit in Oregon, and uh, ultimately wound what up. Were you doing on, what were you doing on the farms? Like what was the type of work that they had you doing? Yeah, uh, I, so I worked on an olive farm, an olive oil uh, farm in Tuscany. I've gone there four times. Um, and the farmer, who's a dear friend of mine, actually unfortunately just passed away a couple weeks ago. Um, and then in Costa Rica, I was working on a startup fruit farm in Oregon. I did a little bit of some vineyard work. Um, and, you know, it was just really into agricultural labor. I found it very peaceful. It was really good for my uh, mental well-being. Um, and I just enjoyed the work. And I really wasn't thinking about it in terms of like a career or anything. What I wanted to do was be uh, a really successful music producer, but that is kind of a weird world to break into. Um, and so I kind of bounced back and forth between like recording studios and I dabbled in some music publishing and music promotions. Um, and farms and farm to table restaurants and uh, did a lot of stuff that was not really noteworthy for a while. And then in 2005, uh, I had been living in the Pacific Northwest. I moved back to Boston, started working at this high end James Beard award winning farm to table restaurant. Um, and then on my days off, I would book these studio sessions and I would basically just pay for studio time to educate myself about how to make records. And sometimes I would work on my own stuff. Sometimes I would work on other people's stuff. Uh, and I was also writing for a recording magazine at the time. Um, and I mean, I really 
worked seven days a week for for almost five years. And one day I may be learning how to break down a whole pig or something or make foie gras or something like that. Um, and uh, on another day I might be in some really amazing recording studio in Boston or in Vermont or in New York City. I, I love the image here of you like breaking down a pig and then like well, work, <laughs> w- working with like a ska band called Three Little Pigs or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not too far off. Yeah, I mean... I dabbled. I, I want to stress that, like, I could not break down a pig for you today. That's one of those things that, like, I got it's, to it's see. A, it's a big animal. It's okay. I got to you see know. it once. It's a big you animal. Get, yeah, you get, if you sure. can pull the bacon out, we'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, you know, I would work in the kitchen during the day. And then uh, during service, I would work on the floor as a waiter and made better money that way and was able to put that into the recording studio thing. Uh, I met the woman who would become my wife working at this restaurant. She was just a broke grad student at the time doing her and graduate this degree. This is where this is a restaurants in Cambridge. Is restaurants in Boston? Where is yeah, Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yep. Um, the original, the first restaurant where we met was called Craigie Street Bistro. That ultimately became Craigie on Main, and then I went on to work at some other uh, nice places after that as well. Um, Cambridge, there, there are some like colleges there, right? Like this is a good place. To <laughs> yeah, one or students. one or two. Yeah, one or two, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. Um, and then in 2010, uh, my wife got a job offer uh, once she got done with graduate school. Wait, wait, wait hang on. We can't, we can't just skip ahead. I, I okay, want to okay. hear, you know, this is all about, you know, the Company of Dads podcast is all about being a lead dad. Tell me a little bit more about your wife, how you met her, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, how you wooed her? How I wooed her. Uh, she's Italian, so I wooed her with cooking. Um, she, uh, she is still, you know, we've been together like 14 years now. Uh, just the greatest joy I've ever known. Um, Prior to meeting her, I had been through a string of really dysfunctional, unhealthy relationships and had kind of made a habit of uh, pursuing women who would make me feel better about myself because they needed some sort of um, emotional, you know, uh, support from me. Um, Very codependent. And, And that kind of reached a peak in 2005 um, when I was involved with a woman and she was the victim of some uh, violent sexual trauma and the way that that relationship ended was cataclysmic for me. And um, and so I moved back east to be closer to my family and got involved in some therapy, some psychotherapy um, and was, was single and, um, uh, you know, bordering on celibate for for a few years intentionally because it, it had been a pretty pretty radical shift for me when i met my wife i had never met anyone like her um she was so kind and um was not into playing games was not into anything codependent um was so fast fascinating to me just as a person she had had a really interesting life up to that point already her father had to work for ibm and they had she had lived all over the place. She had lived in Paris and uh, Connecticut, your neck of the woods, and um, North Carolina. And she had gone to school for architecture and then urban planning. And I just really enjoyed hearing about her discipline. I knew nothing about it. Um, and uh, yeah, to answer your question, how did I woo her? Uh, I cooked pretty well for her. <laughs> um, and I, and uh, you know, I was emotionally available for her. I, um, I had come to a place... You didn't have some sort of line like, you know, hey, you know, I, I worked on an olive farm in Tuscany. You know, I probably, I, no, I probably you know, use that, that line. I would use it if I could yeah, use no, it. I, I yeah, def- no, I definitely use that. And I said, hey, do you want to see what a recording studio is like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, yeah, yeah, look, I think there were some mutual interests there. Um, I think what, if there's one thing we would agree upon, it's that our individual worlds were so different from one another and i think that we recognized an opportunity to complement one another right like her experience was so different from anything i had had and vice versa and we were just so fascinated by the things that we were into that the other was into on a day-to-day basis and i just genuinely loved hearing about her day the stuff that she was getting involved in and i just had a million questions um and that that still holds true. I just, I'm, you know, it's uh, if my career is any indication, um, you can tell that I get I get bored with things and people easily, and I have yet to get bored with her. I'm just 
I find her endlessly fascinating. So that, that, that's good. That, that's yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's worked out really well for me. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Um, but I know that her job uh, brought you to Montana. But before yeah. we get to that, uh, you went back to school, right? And you finished up at Hampshire College. Did I make that up, or is that true? No, that no, that's correct. Yeah. So so. We moved to New York City in 2010. I was getting more recording studio work. I want to clarify, I did not ever produce anything that made it to uh, a Katy Perry or Eminem record. I was working regularly as an engineer in a songwriter studio for Sony, ATV, and EMI writers. And these are the people who write songs for those people. So I worked on a lot of those sessions. And I worked on sessions uh, where songwriters were working on material for those people, but I could never claim that I had any hand in a Katy Perry hit or something like that. Um, the other interesting gig I had at the time was uh, Converse, a shoe company. At the time, they had gotten into this whole lifestyle branding thing, and they were doing things like uh, starting recording studios, funding independent films, building skate parks and basketball courts. And so I had an ongoing gig as an in house producer at the Converse studio. And that was a really amazing situation, too, because uh, for me, it meant I got to work in a very clean, very professional, very high-end recording studio. The work was just kind of served to me on a platter. I didn't have to go out and chase it. The people were awesome. And it was a really cool insight into what at the time was a new frontier in in marketing, right? This, this whole lifestyle branding thing was really interesting. And the guy who uh, ran that whole program for Converse, a guy named uh, Jeff Cottrell, um, he really had this vision that was really, really cutting edge and they put a lot of money into it. And I think they made a lot of lifelong fans out of Converse. Um, but ultimately I was unfulfilled. Um, that sort of work was feast or famine. I would work my butt off for three weeks and then I wouldn't have a gig for a month. And meanwhile, my wife has just started her career in architecture and she's starting to make some slow, um, but steady gains. Um, there was stuff I was seeing on a day-to-day basis in the recording studio world that was, you know, definitely not G rated was not stuff I could really share with my future in-laws and then hurricane Sandy hit and we got involved in the, uh, relief efforts. And I just kind of had this awakening that I had, I had gotten off track that I had lost sight of what my ideals were, what was important to me. Um, and at the time we were living in cobble Hill in Brooklyn. And if you're not familiar, um, it is literally a hill. And, you know, we were watching water flow down the hill. We had all our lights on or cable on, and we were watching it go to the poorer neighborhoods at the bottom of the hill and just ruin people's lives. And, um, and I, you know, I just kind of felt like, what am I doing? Uh, so, yeah, I went back to college. Uh, I went to Hampshire College in Western Mass, um, which is this very progressive sort of design your own major college. So I designed a degree in food policy. I wanted to get back to my agricultural roots. Um, and I spent a lot of time working with both terrestrial agriculture, working with cows and pigs and goats and chickens, things like that. And then fisheries and, uh, aquaculture, what's called integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. That's this is where you, yeah, right. You have these recirculating tanks and the idea is that the, the fish eat food and then they poop and the poop floats down. And then, uh, these filter feeders and deposit feeders eat the poop and then they release the nitrogen and then the nitrogen helps kelp grow and you can use the kelp for biofuel or cosmetics or whatever. And, you, and you, I really, you're losing the listeners here. So, yeah. I'm, I don't doubt it. Um, I wanted to solve problems through food. And I, what I thought I was going to do was, you know, go work for fish and wildlife or maybe go work for some really sustainable agricultural organization. But what wound up happening was the college did like a shark tank style competition and I threw together a plan for an ice cream company, just totally off the cuff. This was not my life's dream, but to make a long story short, they gave me a check for $100,000 the week that I graduated college. That's and it was amazing. this, it was amazing. Yeah. And it was the same week that um, my wife got a job offer in Montana. So we said, well, let's go for it. Let's move out to Montana. We'll learn to ski. And uh, she could continue to develop her career and I could try to start this ice cream company. I have this uh, vision here because, you know, I, I do live in Connecticut now. I grew up in Western Massachusetts, but we would go up to sort of southern Maine sometimes uh, for sort of vacations. Like you'd go for a couple days or something like that. And there was this place in Wells, Maine. And Wells, uh-huh. Maine is sort of like the, the poor cousin to 
Kennebunkport where generations of, of bushes and walkers and everyone has gone. And there was this one ice cream shop there that had lobster ice cream. I've had it. I've had, I've yes. had the lobster ice cream. I've been the there. Lobster yeah. Ice cream. Absolutely. So, so did yeah. you, that, that I have to ask, I say that because with the emperor <laughs> of ice cream, did you combine sort of aquaculture and an ice cream? Could I get like, you know, a, a Rocky salmon road or something like that? No, no, we didn't do anything that outlandish. We were, we were trying to no mint modern. chocolate trout. Nothing like oh, that. Gosh, no, no. That's so funny that you mentioned the lobster ice cream. I've literally had that. Um, it was awful. Uh, <laughs> we we were trying to do a modern update on the ice cream truck and create this synergy between um, the grocery store aisle and an ice cream truck. And you know, I ultimately raised two hundred fifty thousand dollars for that company through a variety of institutional investors, USDA loans, friends and family investors. Um, we ran the company here for three years. The first two years went almost to the dollar, uh, exactly as I thought they would go. The third year was really hard. I had two potentially large investors on the hook. We were talking about $1.5 million to go national. I couldn't get them on the same page about what the terms would be and what that cash injection was going to do for us. But meanwhile, we were operating as a small business. We had to keep the lights on. My wife and I are starting to get itchy. We want to have kids. We want to move on to the next thing. So we put it to bed. We just liquidated the assets. Um, we paid everyone who we owed money to their money back. I never missed a payment. And I just look at it as a DIY MBA. I like to say that yeah. I failed smartly. I was able to get out and keep my shirt. Um, and then after that, you know, the next big events were. Well, hi, don't, 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 don't give the story away yet. Don't give okay. The story okay. Away. All right. So, uh, yeah. But tell me a bit more. So it was so 2017 ish. Is that when it started? In 2019, it wound down. 2016. What, what uh, are you talking? We year started one? it in 2015. 2015 uh, okay. Yeah, uh, and we ran it through 2018, and then 2019 was kind of like liquidating assets, yeah. selling stuff off. What, what paying, were some of the things that back. it was known for? Like, what were some of the flavors you created? What were the things like people who were going and buying the ice cream, yeah. and the Emperor of ice cream? What were the what were the things that they really liked? Well, before we started making ice cream, we toured the country and we ate ice cream everywhere. I want to give that a shout been, out. That must have been tough. That must it have been so a really tough. Yeah. tough yeah. job. Yeah. Um, we had this ice cream in San Francisco from this place called Mr. and Mrs. Miscellaneous that blew my mind. I don't know if it's still there, but um, we wanted to emulate that. So we learned, well, how do they make their ice cream so damn good? Um, so what we ultimately came to was it was called vat pasteurization. It's a lower, slower cook of the ice cream. You retain a lot of the healthy bacteria. Um, you have to add less sugar because you get the sweeter, uh, and creamier mouthfeel just from the lactose. Um, and we were just told all the time, this is the best ice cream I've ever had in my life. And I will say it's the best ice cream I ever had in my life. I hear that Bertillon in Paris might, might give me a run for my money, although I have yet to try it. Um, it was really good. Probably the biggest flavor uh, we had was one called Grandstand Snacks, and it was like Cracker Jacks and ice cream. And it was basically, it was it was pretty awesome. It was Did a your teeth hurt at the end of it? Did your teeth No, teeth no, it was, it, it was popcorn infused ice cream with a, uh, with a black strap molasses caramel and roasted peanuts, and it was it was out of this world. Yeah, it was really really good. <laughs> so. well, take us the other. What was a flavor that you thought would have been great and it nobody liked it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'll tell you, cheesecake was really really hard to get right. Like strawberry cheesecake um, or cherry cheesecake, I just bashed my head against the wall trying to get that right to get it to not taste like cheese but still be reminiscent right. of cheesecake i couldn't ever get it uh and people would try it and they would just say no this isn't it i'm thinking of you differently now i'm looking at you now as like you know the the, the willy wonka of, of ice cream here the way you do it like the johnny had, Depp, the johnny depp he, willy wonka not the yeah the, yeah right yeah um i had a, i had a lot of kids a lot of a lot of youngsters who knew who i was and uh had a lot of a lot of good friendships with uh other parents because yeah. their kids got to know me and they felt like we were a safe place where they could send the kids and trust that their kids were going to be taken care of and they were going to have a, uh, they were going to eat something that was, you know, obviously sweet, but was not full of a bunch of preservatives, preservatives or junk, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Where did the name come from? The Emperor of Ice Cream. It just sounds awesome. Where did that name come from? Yeah, it's a, it's a Wallace Stevens poem. Uh, it's a great Wallace Stevens poem. Um, and Wallace Stevens is something, um, his poetry is something that my wife and I connected on really early in our relationship. We had some Wallace Stevens poems read at our wedding. 
uh, and we just thought it was kind of a, it was kind of a bold name that yeah. set us apart from all the other companies. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. All right, so the company winds down, and then we're you know 2019. That also coincides with when you became a dad, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so what had happened was. Um, we had moved to Montana. My wife was working for this developer here. Um, her career is really starting to blow up and she was uh, getting all sorts of nice perks, including um, uh, access to these very exclusive mountain clubs. And uh, we, you know, I was hanging out regularly with the, the leaders of the, the world, right? And professional athletes and rubbing elbows with these people. And I had a real imposter syndrome because I felt like uh, I didn't earn it, so I don't deserve it. I never had any money. I didn't come from money. Um, and so what I was doing was uh, drinking and smoking weed very regularly to kind of numb that pain uh, and to numb the failure of my business. And I had gotten really, really good at articulating and maintaining a mild buzz throughout the day without anybody knowing. And I could... Uh, you know, vape technology and Visine goes a long way, you know, and yeah. I would, I would send my wife out the door and say, have a good day. And I would start, uh, you know, I would hit my vape pen and then by 11 o'clock or 12, maybe I'm having a little drink or something and, and had gotten just very sneaky with my usage. And if it's like, if she was going to come home for lunch that day, I was going to, I was going to take a shower so that she wouldn't smell like marijuana or liquor on me. Um, but I was going to do it early enough so that then the, the smell of my face wash would be gone so that you wouldn't come home and say, oh, that's weird. Why did you take a shower at noon or something, you know? And, and I had gotten so clever, uh, and it got to the point that she could walk in the door at five o'clock and I'd be like, Hey, look, I'm mixing us a drink. And this is my first drink of the day, but really it was like my third and I had been stoned since 10 AM or something. Um, it was awful. And, uh, was and, she, was she pregnant at the time or were you a dad? Nope. No, no. Yeah. Neither, neither. Uh, and yeah, just, just two single parents and my business had, had failed and I felt horrible about that. And I was very aware of this divergent earnings potential. She, she was starting to head towards the stratosphere and I, I was just like floundering. Um, so I decided to get sober. Um, and there were a number of things that happened to lead me up to that. But one of the big ones was, I ran into, you know, in this, in this exclusive mountain environment, I ran into a real hero of mine, uh, Mike McCready, who is the guitarist for Pearl Jam. Um, and he's been open about, uh, being sober. Um, and he's someone I've looked up to my whole life when I was working in the record industry, it was like my dream to work with him and I never got to. Mm -hmm. And now here I was just hanging out with him and talking to him and I was a little hungover and I was a little stoned. And, um, Another thing that he and I shared is um, he's been really public about his struggles with uh, Crohn's and colitis and Crohn's and colitis are in both my family and my wife's family. That was something else that we had connected yeah. on really early on. And it just, it just became really clear to me, like this guy is here in this environment because he earned it. He's sober. He's here with his wife and children. He's very present in the moment. And I was the exact opposite of that. I felt like I didn't belong there but I was there because my wife's employer basically let me hang out. Um, I was not present. I was intoxicated. Uh, we had gotten off track from our hopes of having kids. Um, so I decided to get sober. I went into a church basement. Uh, I heard stuff in that meeting that made my hair stare up, stand up on end. Um, and Paul, I shit you not, 10 days later, I found out I was going to be a dad. And I was like, well, that's it. I, this is, this is my life now. And, um, and I went really hard into both 12-step uh, and uh, Dharma-based recovery approach. Um, and by the time my daughter was born, I had been sober for nine months and I've been sober ever since. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank um, and when she was born, what was the discussion as to who would be you know, the, the primary parent? Was it just always a, a sort of a, a parent that you would be the, the lead dad? Or was it something that, you know... Because the, the other part is you, you've been working as a audio producer uh, for, for public radio. You, you, you're an adjunct professor at Montana State. So there's other stuff you got going on. But what was the conversation or was there a conversation as to who would be the, the primary parent? 
Yeah, uh, if I'm honest, that conversation was had much earlier. It was when we found out that we were going to be parents. And the question was, do we want to have this child? Um, and if not, what what are our alternatives and what are we comfortable with? Um, but the, the big part of that was, well, what is the household dynamic? Uh, my wife's earnings potential, you know, continued to look great. And mine at that point was kind of a question mark, uh, more than anything, because the job market in Montana is, is really, really rough. So we felt tied to this place, both by virtue of her paycheck and also just because we love it here. We really love the lifestyle, the outdoor environment. We love skiing. And we felt like that is an ideal place for us to raise a kid, um, for us personally. Um, and, you know, there were some hard conversations really early on, but it was maybe two weeks of some some really tough, tough soul searching and um, ultimately just came to this place that, yes, she would work, she would continue to work full time um, because we saw that as being really beneficial for our family and that I would work part time and be a full time dad. Um, of course, this was before the pandemic hit. Yeah. And at the time we were thinking, oh, this is like a, you know, six month or maybe nine month proposition. It turned into more like a two year proposition before my daughter could actually start daycare. She's two and a half now. Um, so yeah, I started teaching. Right. So part- the, the, those first two years, you know, coincides almost completely with the pandemic. There was no option. Is that correct for daycare? She was with you a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. She was with, yep. She was with us a hundred percent of the time, uh, with the exception of my mother-in-law who had moved here with her husband, my father-in-law, um, to be closer to her grandchild. She was able to help a couple days a week, but she has a, a pre-existing health condition that made us have to be extra cautious around the pandemic. So we were extremely isolated for a couple of years. It w- I mean, we were, it was just us. It was like, myself, my wife, my daughter, and my in-laws for two solid years. Um, and, and I can say that my sobriety was a real asset throughout that, yeah. <laughs> throughout that journey, you know? So, yeah. And so then as you start coming out of it, but, you know, tell me about, you know, when you start combining, you know, the, the balancing act that, that every lead dad does between, you know, being there for your wife, being there for your daughter, but also, you know, trying to fulfill your own potential, doing some of the stuff you're doing in, in, in radio, doing, you know, the entrepreneurship classes that you're teaching at Montana State. Talk to me about that that juggling act. Yeah, it was a day-to-day process and no two days were the same. Um, prior to joining Montana State University, uh, I was producing a podcast out here um, for the Montana Free Press or a nonpartisan, nonprofit, political watchdog uh, journalistic outlet. And that was really hard. I absolutely loved the work. I absolutely loved the people I worked with. But um, you're chasing headlines and, you know, you have a guest booked and then all of a sudden the guest has to bail because that guest is a senator or something and has something in D.C. that they have to go deal with. And suddenly we're scrambling to pull something together. Um, It was really, really challenging for our household because my schedule was all over the place. And that was when we realized it made more sense for me to go work at MSU where at least I could have more of a set schedule. It would be part time and I could pick and choose the courses I wanted to teach. Uh, but that is a much better fit for us right now. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it really depends on the week. I think one really big benefit here is that my wife has um, gone into a leadership position at her company. So she has a lot more flexibility. So there are days when she's on the road or in the office and there are days when she's working home, working from yeah. home. Um it's a constant, it's a constant conversation. You know, every single day is, it's like a new program. No two days look alike. Yeah. I always found that when I, you know, all the years I was at the New York times that having a rigid schedule is what allowed me to be a lead dad. But at the same time, that rigid schedule, I just, I, I love when things would get scrambled. You know, it's more exciting to have, to not know what's going on. I mean, I agree to plan out your week, you know, week after week after week. Now, again, yeah. nobody wants to hear somebody complain about uh, being a, a business columnist in the New York Times. Everything about it was awesome. But, <laughs> awesome. you know, yeah. you think back to like, I think back to like before I was, you know, a father, before I was married, you know, that was exciting. You just didn't know what was going to go on. And, you know, I always say, look, this doesn't last forever. Uh, at a certain point, however many kids we have, the the last of them have have moved out of the house and they're living their own life. And then we'll, we'll figure it out. This is a period of time, but I, I've often found that, you know, 
some weeks were more challenging than others. I'm sure you probably found it somewhat similar in your role. Ab- absolutely. There, there are some weeks that feel like a real gauntlet. Others are a bit easier. Um, what I've learned is that kids really need a routine and uh, it's to everyone's benefit. That's funny because what I've learned is that kids only get sick when you have a busy day. <laughs> I've also learned that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yes, that that's random whole, random Thursday, you got uh, nothing to do. They just go off to school like that. And you're like, huh, okay. Right. But when you get something on the books, right? Then yeah. 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 But yeah, you know, um, look, my kid is high energy. Uh fortunately I'm a morning person. So she and I <laughs> pop out of bed at seven o'clock and we're ready to go. And she's helping me make breakfast. And we try to let my wife sleep in a little bit. Um, and then it's I, I joke with my wife that we should start our days with like the uh, the adrenaline syringe from Pulp Fiction. We should each <laughs> keep one at the bedside table and just like stab each other in the chest like first thing in the morning, you know? <laughs> See, I always thought that the equivalent of that was a small child putting her face right next to your head as you're asleep <laughs> and saying, Daddy, yeah, it's, it's morning time. It's, it's time sweeter. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot sweeter for sure. Either that or... Daddy, I just threw up. And you're like, what? You just threw up? And then boom, <laughs> you're out of the bed like that. That's that's the adrenaline needles of the chest. Right, yeah. Look, I, um, you know, this this question of juggling schedules, it's not like either my wife or I are in any sort of driver's seat. We're both beholden to a lot of other people. I'm beholden to a bunch of students um, and colleagues. And my wife is beholden to uh, a lot of development people, construction, contracting people, and homeowners. And uh, we have questions and demands and needs coming up all day, every day. And we're just constantly having to pivot or replan a day on the fly. It just feels like it never ends. You know, one thing, having, you know, kind of been a lead dad before the pandemic and continue to be a lead dad through it, um, I've started to feel like, at least for me, people and for my wife, people are slightly more uh, understanding. They're, they're more understanding. They've kind of, the genie's out of the bottle. Like we're never going back to this world where work is over here and family is is over there. They're, they're going to be jumbled in some way. Um, yep. How is that? I mean, has your wife's employer made that, you know, realization? I mean, construction schedules are different. I'm wondering if, you know, because that's so much of what I'm trying to do with the company dad just to sort of, you know, normalize that we have to balance, you know, work and family now and not just have it be, you know, talk, HR speak that, that right. means nothing. And I'm wondering if, if, you know, as the pandemic has gone on, if there have been moments where you've been able to find a little bit more balance between the two of you. Um, certainly moments, yeah. Uh, my wife's employer has been extremely supportive and understanding of that. Um, and we're, we're so fortunate for that. And I'm not going to say that this hasn't been challenging, but my heart aches for people who have more kids and less money and, right. and, uh, employers who are not as understanding because it's been really challenging for us and we're in a very supportive situation. Um, and, and, you know, my, my employer, um, has been as flexible as they can be, I think to the extent that they can. Um, obviously I have to be in class certain times, so that can't really change. But beyond that, there's been a high degree of flexibility with regard to office hours, team meetings, gradings, things like that, you know? So, um, so that's been, that's been wonderful. And my hope is that we'll just continue to see that become the norm rather than the exception. Right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, good. Um, Alex has been really wonderful talking to you on the company that has podcast. I always like to give the guest the last hope. The last hope, the last word. I always like to give the last, <laughs> I'm going to leave that blooper in, the last hope. Great. The last word to you, Alex. When you think about, you know, what you've learned in the, the two plus years as, as a lead dad and, and sort of what la- lessons really stick with you, you know, share one or two of those le- lessons with, with the listeners. Yeah, um, it can be really, it can feel uh, really emasculating at times when your wife makes a lot more money than you and has a higher professional status than you. Um, and that earnings disparity has been really difficult for me to wrap my head around. What has taken me a long time to realize and to fully embrace and to be really, really proud to say is that my empathy is a real asset for my wife and my daughter. Um, and that my sobriety supports 
my ability to empathize. Um, and so I, I'm not here to proselytize to your listeners. And I, most of my other friends who are parents uh, are enjoying drinks at five o'clock and by, like, by all means do it. I personally could never have just one. Uh, if I was going to have one, I was going to have three. And if I was having three, I may as well have a fourth, you know? Um, and I guess if you're listening and if that rings true for you, just just consider that uh, your children are young. Their, their little amygdalas are not fully formed yet. And the way that you show up emotionally and mentally and the way that you uh, have presence for your children and your partner um can be vital to their growth, their development, their health, and their ability to succeed. Alex, that's great. Um, Thank you. And I I said I'd give you the last word, but um, I I lied because you you brought up something there around money and masculinity. And by the time this podcast airs, another one will have already aired. And that's one with Brad Klontz, in which he tries to unpack. He's a financial psychologist, and he tries to unpack this real challenge that we as men have because it's and this is part of what the company of dads is trying to do is trying to normalize this idea that just because you're the man you you have to be the breadwinner whereas i think a healthier more 2022 version of this is let's find a way for you know both people to fulfill their their potential and that may mean that one person earns more money at, at this point and, and you know may it may shift going forward but to sort of you know, normalize that to sort of get rid of some of that shame that we as men carry if we're not not the breadwinner. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I look forward to listening to that. Uh, I totally agree with it. And what I found really has worked well for us. Um, and and I kind of got this from reading your book, actually, The Thin Green Line. Um, but my wife and I agreed it would be beneficial for me to take on the management of our household finances. And that was huge because suddenly I felt like I had some control in this and that I was in the driver's seat rather than in the passenger seat. And I'm helping manage um, short-term and long-term savings, our, our you know month-to-month budgeting. And I feel like I have a real active role now in how our financial assets uh, are managed and grow. And that has really helped to diminish that sense of emasculation quite a bit. Alex, thank you again. I enjoyed talking to you on the Company of Dads podcast. Thank you, Paul. You too. Be well.